guys, I'm going to try not to catastrophize here, but uh, I'm recording this after we did our recording with Bill. Um, Nathan and I use a uh, streaming platform, EV Mux, and, and after this episode, we, we are done with it. Um, we, we lost about, I don't know, 20 minutes at the end of the episode with Bill. Uh, so Nathan was unable, you know, Bill was nice enough to, to kind of do a little outro message to include here at the end. Um, Nathan wasn't able to make it. So during that segment and the last part of the episode, kind of like the outro and thank you, um, you know, it's just me with Bill. Uh, so, you know, obviously we weren't able to recreate that chemistry, but we still ended it with the message, um, wasn't perfect like the first time around, but you guys are going to be listening to the recording that I just did the night before with Nathan and Bill. So sorry about the inconvenience with that. Hopefully you guys still enjoy our very first segment of species spotlight and take care. We never fuck up. What are you talking about, (laughs) Lucas? All right, guys, what's going on? Appreciate you guys listening to another episode of the Retick Lounge, and this week is going to be a special week because every single week we typically talk about reticulated pythons. Um, but Nathan and I are excited to introduce you. This is the first episode of a new segment called Species Spotlight, where once a month we're going to be getting uh, different breeders from uh, different animals, snakes, monitors, basically anything exotic, you name it, and we will have them on. That way, if there are any other kind of vented, uh, vested interests that you guys have, we'll be able to have someone who's pretty knowledgeable about it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm excited for this one. Nathan, great call on the name Species Spotlight. That was money. That was spot on. I, I feel like it was too easy, but yeah, if it, if it works, then it works. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm excited about this. I'm excited about uh, the whole week and just what we get to do with our, our guests. So um, Lucas, anything else before we jump on? Yeah. So for those of you that listened to our episode last week, Nathan and I kind of touched on looking forward to doing a live from Arlington um, and just to kind of get some background and explaining why you guys are listening to a pre-recorded episode. Um, it's just going to be a jam-packed weekend. The only time we really could like figure out how to do a live is if we did it like in the afternoon on Friday when all of you are working and that just didn't make sense. So um, we are going to be airing this Friday. Um, and so most of you will be listening to it while we're actually at our guest's place. Um, and then the following week, you will see our pre-recorded uh, kind of lounge episode that we're going to be doing uh, while we are at Arlington over at our host, Phil Thompson with Cold-Blooded, uh, Thompson Cold-Blooded. Uh, so we're looking forward to getting that episode recorded while we're there. But enough about that. Let's go ahead and uh, introduce our guest. We have Bill Stiegel of Phoenix Reptiles that we are going to be having on talking about green tree pythons. Whether you're just getting into retics or you've been breeding for years, the first place you want to visit is Stewart Design. More and more breeders keep showing up at shows, on Morph Market, and are all over social media. Sometimes it may feel possible to get anyone's attention. Stewart Designs help small businesses like yours do big things through brand clarity, helping entrepreneurs to start and scale businesses that are easy to know and love. Their work can help any company or industry, but they've done a ton of work for ours. Stewart Design created the brands for US Arc, Canova, Reach Out Reptiles, Coiled, and dozens of other well known reptile breeders. Like many of us, the owner of Stewart Design, Blake, is a keeper and breeder who fell in love with Retix through first working with Garrett Hartle. Although Stewart Design does a lot of corporate work, Blake has a passion for working with people in the reptile industry. Stewart Design can help if you're just getting started or you're ready to take things to the next level. You're struggling to stand out and build your presence online or at shows. You don't want to be like the other guys or get lost in the crowd. And you want to make your own way doing what you love. And also, you have big ideas and know your business is special, but you need help sharing it with the reptile community. If something here resonates with you, reach out to Blake and have a conversation. To learn more or get started, visit stuartdesignbrands.com or call them at 855 855- SD logos. Clear brands own markets. Stuart Design helps create them. 
If you are in the market for an enclosure for your reticulated python or any other one of your reptiles, Focus Cubed Habitats is your one-stop shop for not only the best looking cages on the market, but also provide amazing features and add-ons to your cages. We partnered with Focus Cubed Habitats because they continue to innovate and change the way we house our animals unlike any other caging company out there. Their cages are designed intelligently and provide the most stylish and secure housing for your animals' comfort and well-being. Visit focuscubedhabitats.com for your animals' caging needs. Again, visit focuscubedhabitats.com for some amazing and stylish enclosures. We also want to thank VivTech Products for being an affiliate sponsor of the Retic Lounge. Stop by VivTech Products for the best UV spectrum lighting on the market that will enhance and improve your snake's overall well-being and health. Visit VivTechProducts.com and use the code RETICLOUNGE23 today for 15% off. Again, visit VivTechProducts.com and use our affiliate code RETICLOUNGE23 today for 15% off. Looking for the perfect accessories for your hatchlings or juvenile retics? Look no further than Heli Guy Serpents. Our sponsor, Chris Sexton, is coming in hot with an amazing 3D printer, creating top-notch perches and other caging accessories for your beloved pets. Enrich your retics environment with their high-quality products. Use our promo code TRL10 for a 10% discount on your purchase. Visit them today at heliguyserpents.com and start giving your pets the best. Heli Guy Serpents, the premier source for 3D printed caging accessories. Again, that's www.heliguyserpents.com and use our promo code TRL10 for 10% off all of your 3D printed accessories today. Let me go ahead and bring him on over here. And there he is. Bill, what's going on, man? Hey, guys. How are we all doing? Doing Good. great, man. Hey man, what an honor it what an honor it is to be on on your uh very first episode of your jumping out of the species. Right, right. Yeah. Um I couldn't have think of anyone better or like more exciting outside of a species like reticulated python. So yeah, I'm excited well, about it. Well the timing's great because I'm gonna get to see you guys uh right. in just a few short days. Right. Looking, looking forward to that. And I mean, I'm a little biased as well because I am jumping into a new species, at least during my adult life. And it happens to be green tree pythons that you work with and I'm getting the animal from you. So yes, it just, it's coming together. I feel like this is the right time to do it. I'm super excited to put it in your hands. It's, uh, it's doing absolutely incredible. It's just, it's a perfect animal and I just can't wait for you to see it. Yeah, I'm excited. I'll probably be in in your your snake room all all Friday. Um, yeah. So so do us a favor, Phil. Um, for you know we have a lot of retake listeners, Phil? which or, or Phil, I said Phil. We were talking about <laughs> Phil earlier. <laughs> Bill, um, Bill, uh, kind of uh, you know. By the way, you would qualify to be on the retake lounge regardless. You do have what one retake, two retakes. I have one retake. One retake, and it's what? What is it again? I remember handling it last time. I think it was produced by Andrew. It was produced by Andrew Acevedo, and hell, you know, you know the animal better than I do. Probably it. It is uh, six sixty uh, percent super dwarf, Kalatoa. Um, I think it's a tiger, or a, a, it's tiger head anery. There we go. Uh, and it's got one other uh, mutation in it. I, actually, I have it, but. I just literally, within the last month, send it to a friend of mine for breeding loan because I'm not awesome. a retake breeder. But you'll get a chance to meet them, uh, the Todd and Julie Gavin. They're local to me, and uh, they have a perfect uh, female for it. And so um, we're going to see what happens. Awesome. Yeah. I'm looking forward to, to you know, I unfortunately won't be able to see. It was a cool retake. That's um, very cool. But, um do our listeners a favor, if you don't mind, just kind of talking about, you know, Phoenix reptiles and kind of what, what you do and, and all that good stuff. Um, and, and I mean, you know, obviously we're, we're wanting to talk about green tree pythons, but feel free to talk about any other species that you keep and breed. I know you got probably a handful that you work a lot with. Yeah. So, you, uh, you know, you've been to my facilities, you know, I'm 
Um, I'm probably most known for my green tree pythons, and they're really my my passion. I've been keeping and producing those for over a decade. Um, but I keep other species. Uh, I love I love ball pythons. Ball pythons are where I got my start. It's where I learned about reptiles, and um, it brings me a lot of pleasure to continue to work with them. Um, as an in, as a kind of a gateway or an introductory uh, reptile to people. I mean, I just absolutely love. I've been small local expos where I bring nothing but ball pythons and you know introduce new keepers you know, uh, right to that species. It's a great, uh, it's a great entry level animal. And I really, really enjoy doing it. Um, yeah. It's like the see, marijuana that, of drugs. That, that's, <laughs> that's interesting it, for me to hear because as a retic keeper, like I'm still a little bit nervous to get into green tree pythons. Like they don't seem like a beginner animal to me. Well, I'm talking about ball pythons. Oh, 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 oh sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So, what what projects do you work with with ball? Like what what are you bringing this year? Like is it do you work with any of the high end stuff or is it mostly just like that entry level stuff to get like, people in? Almost all we all of my stuff is entry level or intermediate level stuff. So a lot of okay, eye cool. candy, you know, a lot of blue eyed lucies and pides and cool looking clown combos and and uh, just yeah just stuff like that. I you know eye candy kind of stuff and it's so. Um, it's awesome because it's so different than the green tree. Like it's totally opposite end of the spectrum. I, I work with entry level ball pythons and I'm meeting people that have never held a snake before. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, my green trees, you know, or green trees are not an advanced species uh, to keep it all. Um, but the stuff that I happen to work with tends to be higher end designer stuff. And, you know, people that have a lot of experience with reptiles, even if they're getting their first one, you know, they, they, they tend to have a lot of experience. So it's just different, different vibes, totally different uh, things. I, I, I love them both. Totally. Did, didn't you just produce your first clutch of, of bloods? Uh, no, I've produced, uh, I have Borneo short tail pythons, okay, okay. which are, you know, they're obviously they're in the blood python family. Um, but I've got um, six breeder Borneos. I've produced, Borneo short tail pythons for probably five or six years. I usually produce oh, one, awesome. or, one or one or two clutches a year. Oh, and what, again, what what projects are you working with the Borneos? Uh, so Sideswipe is what I produced this year, and okay. then I also work with Genetic Stripe, Super Stripe, and Ocelot Whitewash. That that uh, uh, stuff in the Borneos. Okay. Awesome. So. Um. What one of your one of my favorite animals that you have is actually a hybrid. Yeah, it's, it's, it's your carpondro. Okay. Yeah. What what yeah. are your, what are your, what are your thoughts about like the the hybridization? Obviously, you have it as a as a. Do you plan to try to breed it? Is it just like a pet and like a, a look at animal type of thing? Or well, it's it's a stunning animal, and you're not alone. Of the people that walk in my room, the vast majority of them, whether a snake they're a snake person or not they say that that's like the most incredible snake they've ever seen. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're not alone um, in, in, you know, picking it out and liking it. Uh, it's a 50% male carpondro and they, they're sterile. I mean, there's never been a, a male carpondro that's ever produced a clutch, a, a, a viable fertile clutch. Oh, no. So, way. yeah. So he's a pet. Female carpondros, 50% carpondros can be fertile. But the males are are not fertile. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder why that is. No idea. Many many people have tried it over many many years, and uh, it's just uh, just has never been done. Like, do uh, they so, lock at all? Like, do they try? Oh yeah, to they'll lock or? they'll lock. Females will lay eggs, and then the eggs die. No way. Okay. Do like seventy five percent males work? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think that's ever. Uh, ever been done. I've tried yeah. it. The Carpondro project killed me. I mean, I tried to produce Carpondros for a decade because I Man. absolutely love them, but they broke my heart. I had so many failures. Um, so I abandoned that project. But luckily, uh, the person that produced the Carpondro that I own, you'll get a chance to meet. He's a local guy. His name's Tony, Tony Jerome, and he's going to be at the place uh, this weekend as well. Super Sweet. great guy. 
he'll be the first one to tell you he's no breeding uh, savant, no expert. He just happens to have two a compatible green tree and a compatible carpet, and they produced they produced many clutches for him. So when you say compatible, like I'm assuming that there's a lot of incompatibility when you try to do the pairings. Yeah, I mean there was for me a lot of a <laughs> lot of a lot of projects. I, I hear I hear the sorrow in your voice. <laughs> I mean, I do listen, we have to bring this up? <laughs> I, I, I've been very very blessed um, in my all of my reptile hobby and passion. Carpenters have not been one of my blessings. They've been one of my, you know just the time to face the music and I faced it and I can't, I just can't tell you how many locks I've had with just beautiful animals. I've had a beautiful 50% Carpondro female that was bred by an incredible green tree male. So that would have been 75% Carpondros, which oh, man. The, the, the number of clutches ever produced, you know, you could probably count on one or two hands and she of course laid slugs and then died, you Damn know, it. So that's the kind of stuff that, uh, right. I mean, if it's okay with you, speaking of heartbreaks, um, which has been the opposite for you, at least since we've been talking over the last couple of years, but green tree pythons, man, how, how long have you been breeding them? Um, when, when did you get your first one? Yeah. So I got, um, I probably got into green trees about, 2009 i think i got my first one and you know that was about 10 years too late i um you know i wish i would have gotten <laughs> earlier but um, seriously though you know i just uh i was worried and at the time and still the the stigma that they're difficult to keep they're very defensive they die they're you know they're just impossible to breed you know i was worried about all of that stuff and um yeah, I my was two finally... biggest worries are they have big teeth and they die easy. <laughs> you know, I, I'm actually happy that you said that. It, it, it's it's validating because I've I've talked to you about kind of my uh my obsession with green tree pythons and it, it stemmed back you know ten years ago. Um, and it's it's funny. I actually was texting a friend today, um, from high school that like knew I kept ball pythons and. Um, we were kind of catching up and they were like, did you ever get to breed those ball pythons that I went with you to pick up with? And I was like, no, I went, you know, to college, play baseball, had to rehome them. He's like, did you ever end up getting a green tree python? Th this was my senior year of high school back in 2011. So I I've been wanting to. And the reason why I haven't is the same exact reason that you just said, just the, the stigma, even though it was yeah. later. Right. So there was a little bit more information out, but yeah. um and then I got caught up in the retics, obsessed with the retics, and wanted to build and kind of get a bunch of localities. And and yeah, it's it you know ten, eleven years since I've been wanting one that I'm finally like I, I don't know brave enough to to finally <laughs> jump in. That's the way that I felt like it. It was a big leap, and at the time I'd I'd kept carpet pythons for a decade before I got my first green tree. And what I've come to find out is, if anything, green trees are more docile and really in a lot of ways easier to keep than carpet pythons. Um, right. But, you know, you were probably exposed to the same animals that I was, and they were typically expo animals, imports, particularly Bioc locality types. And those can, you know, most of them are very defensive animals. You know, they just, they are what they are. Um, and if you, you know, don't take it to a vet, don't get it treated for parasites, don't know what you're, what you're doing, you know, then they're everything that they're chalked up to be. Yeah. Um, but you know, the captive bred stuff is just, they're totally different animals. That's how I try to explain it to people. It's like the difference between a domesticated dog and a wild African dog. That's yeah. literally the difference between captive bred green trees and, you know, a lot of the imports. It's the difference between the retakes we had 25 years ago and the retakes we have now. Oh yeah, exactly. And totally. same with blood, same with blood pythons. I mean, same with bloods. Oh, I, yeah. I was obsessed with bloods for about five years and, and that's what kept me from getting one too, is I just, I heard that, you know, number one, you hear, you know, although they're short, but they're thick, that they're, their bites pack a punch and, and that they were defensive. And I was like, yeah, yeah. no, thank you. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I that's, Great to hear. And, and Nathan, what I'm most excited about you going over to Bill's, you know, this upcoming Friday, 
uh, when I, this is I, I'm airing, I'm scared. I do, like I almost don't <laughs> no, want to go. No, no, no. You're I'm not scared of the snakes. Don't get no, me I'm wrong. No, I'm talking about investing. I, I know. Invest. I the the thing is, Lucas, is you know me, and I need my my tree monitors first. Right. Like, right. Before we get into tree pythons, let's get some tree monitors in this right. house. Tree monitors are so are so much more high maintenance, though. There's so any, much more high monitor. maintenance, but what am I like? That's uh, gonna bring me so much more joy. I'm sorry, Bill. I love you. Well, well, you may ch- you may have a change of heart in a okay. few days. So, we'll, so we'll Nathan, see. I, we'll see. I, I'll, I'll say this: like I went over to Bill's, and number one, this was like, man, finally after all these years, I'm gonna get like hands-on experience. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I'll probably get bit. Um, but dude, I like can't wait for you to experience it because like if we get there a little bit later and people are already there you'll walk into a snake room and people are holding green tree pythons left and right bill's bill's got like four hatchlings two in each hand and 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 like their their perches and they they literally are just like so you can take that you could take out their perch and they just chill like they I've, don't I've care. got to be hands on with uh adult emerald tree pythons or emerald tree boas before um and that was pretty cool uh yeah. richard bilbo yeah. has some that are really oh, that's like right. just Puppy super dog, manageable yeah, yeah. They're, they're they're the same way yeah yeah so i i mean i've i've gotten to experience like that before but on a larger scale this is gonna be pretty cool so i'm scared that yeah i'm gonna want one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't have a doubt that you will, but you are nothing like me in regards to like impulsivity and and like it just. I being don't able have to the ability. To be, I don't have the ability to be that impulsive anymore. Lucas, I'd hardly say you you are impulsive. Well, well, no, okay. So with the green tree python, absolutely not. That took a decade for me to finally jump in. He can yeah, sneak but, in but, retics, but, but, but a new species, not so much. Right. So like with my wife now, like I can sneak in all the retics into my garage and she won't notice. She she looks at a, a red neo. She's like, What the hell is this? <laughs> but but what's what's funny is that the one of the first gifts that my my wife bought me, um uh it when we were dating back in the day in college, um this was in 2013 was she bought me a hard copy of the, the complete condro. Really? Um, yeah, that was written by, by, um, I want to make sure because there's, there's the more complete everything now that's they, out there, but it was uh, Greg Maxwell. Yeah. Greg Maxwell. Exactly. Um, and, uh, yeah, she got me that. So, I mean, I literally like that's how, um, so, so even when she found out, she found out I got my first green tree Python that I was getting one and bringing it home. Yeah. Via via a clip that we posted on Instagram that Nathan oh, no. posted that Nathan posted on the TRL it was a little oh, clip no. about me bringing home a green tree oh, python. Yeah, yeah. And that's I how she home. found out. Yeah, that's how she found out. And I was oh. like, ah, well, you got me. Um, but what I will say is that now that the gates are open, right? Like I, I started making payments towards your animal, and then you know, I found a pair of of long term captive, you know. You told uh, me right a, a ruse a ruse right? yeah so, yeah and that, that that was like what originally captivated me into green tree pythons was just seeing the big white diamond speckles along there and and still to this day is my favorite locality but um yeah not, not have, the flood you have those Do animals have, no i'm actually so i've talked to to joey who i'm getting them from um i think is his social media the chondro kid or maybe he joey's the one who also did the giveaway with the bolins Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, what are you talking about? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah. uh, no, so I'm planning on getting those a month after, um, I have 10 years. Uh, and yes. that's only because of like caging situation that, that just getting everything set up. But, um, yeah, now that the floodgates are open, that's where the impulsivity, Nathan comes, comes into <laughs> the, 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 the inability to control, <laughs> Now, Bill, Lucas mentioned Bullens. I know I've seen pictures of you with Bullens. You don't happen to keep, do you? No, I don't. I don't have a Bullens. But okay. dude, if he, if I he feel did, like I that's a logical in. next step, though. Uh, yes and no. Um, boy, I I love. I mean, they're they're just so incredible, and they're in a lot of ways have some similarities to green trees and to carpets. You know, I I, I love carpet pythons too. They have a really but, cool history in the 
the industry just uh, in general. So, yeah, I'm kind of the same part of the, you know, geographically same part of the world they come from. And uh, they're just big, docile giants, you know, of the arboreal stuff. And right. I absolutely, I absolutely love them. But um, I, I just, if I kept them, I'd want to just have them in a massive, like walk-in, zoo-like right? and right a walk-in, uh, essentially right. a walk-in. And uh, yeah, I don't Something know. It's foggy a, where you wouldn't see them half the time anyway. Exactly. But, yeah. I mean, that's just where they deserve to be. Yeah. Exactly. You know, in, yeah. in my opinion. And I don't know. I don't disagree with you. Uh, speaking of that, um, Reptilandia here in Texas, uh, yeah. I, I, I did an episode on, on NPR and um, on, on retics. We were talking about ethics of keeping retics. And I had so many carpet python people reach out. Um, j- just kind of happy about speaking about like the truth of retics, right? So I, I feel like a lot of the people outside the retic industry are, are, you know, always nagging on the retic husbandry and all that stuff and so when they hear a retic breeder kind of talking about like yeah we do need to step it up you know they they message me i got invited to go to texas carpet fest yeah um so i'll be going to reptilandia but that their setup for their bolins is is like just a dream you know it's a massive massive display that that is completely humid trees everywhere um you know, I almost wonder when they get people to walk through the doors that they are such every animal is kept in such a big naturalistic enclosure. If you're ever going to see them, you see it. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, I I can't wait to get there. You know, it's in my backyard. It's in it's in Texas. And I consider yeah. Ari, Ari a friend. I just have not been able to get there. I'm going to fix that, though. I'm not going to be able to make it to the, the southern, the Texas Carpet Fest. But God, I got to get there. Yeah. Let, do we? Let's let's kind of get back into to green tree pythons. Um, I, I want to know um, what what is your husbandry like for them? And and you spoke about kind of the the stigma of what kept you from wanting to keep them for a while, um, you know. And and I kind of just want to you to paint a picture of what it takes to kind of keep them in today's world with a CBB or even like a long term captive or. Like what, what are the setups, cage sizes from, you know, different lifespans and um, h- how do you keep the animals? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's not complicated. Uh, I think babies and sub adults, uh, you know, yearlings do best in a tub setup. And I literally keep my baby green trees in the same rack right next to baby ball pythons. The only difference is, is I put a, a small removable, perch which is a tiny which is like an infant coat hanger in the shoebox you know size tub with the green trees like little six quart tub yeah six six quart shoebox size tub yeah i've done that with my retics uh the first season that i bred just one little perch that they could you know go across yep absolutely i mean it's so you know setting up a neo um and I'll keep I'll keep those uh, in in a setup like that up to six months old, and then typically I'll I'll move them into a, like a fifteen quart tub, again with one or two coat hanger perches. Um, you're looking at temps, probably eighty five, eighty six, up to eighty eight degrees on the hot side, and then you know I'm seventy eight on on the cool side. Is that with like back heat? Um, you can use back heat, belly heat. It doesn't really matter. Uh, okay. You know, as long as you're getting the, the back end of the tub into the mid 80s. So uh, set up really similar to how, I mean, I'm setting up my retic. Yeah. Well, when yeah. I got my re, when I got my re, retic, Andrew told me, I said, hey, how do I set it up? He goes, set it up just like a chondra. No kidding. Damn it. Yeah. And so I'm wasting that's time. what I did. <laughs> so let, let, let me ask you this. When you're, when you're measuring the temperature on the hot side, are you measuring the perch or are you measuring yeah, the floor? Pitch. No, measuring the perch with a temp gun. Okay. So, so I guess, you know, the floor, like if you're using belly heat, then that, that floor is definitely going to be much hotter than 88. Yeah. It's going to be a little warmer. Not, I mean, not that much warmer, um, okay. but a little bit warmer. Cause you know, that heat rises and right. Um, they, you're not going to find them on the ground of the tub. Um, really with 
significant at all. You know, they, they, they really stay on that perch 99% of the time. Right. And any reason in particular that you keep your Neos with, with water on the bottom instead of like a paper towel, that's super duper damp. Yeah. So, and you know, this is one of the great things about making adjustments. Um, I do keep Neos over water, um, until they have their first shed or their, or their first or their second shed. And that's just because I think they just need to increase humidity. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've started to deviate. I used to keep them over water for longer periods of time, but now it's pretty much first shed first or second shed. And then they're on the damp paper towel perch, small water dish. Okay. Um, I, I'm kind of, this is kind of a little newer to me, but I, I listened to a, a decent amount of, you know, anytime that, that, you know, MJ over at tribe talk um, podcast has someone with chondros on, I, I always try to tune in live or, or definitely I'm listening on Spotify afterwards, but um, prolapse. It's one thing that he talked about maybe two months ago with someone that was on and um, our, 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 uh, you know, neos and hatchlings are they are they pretty susceptible to prolapse and like what's causing it? Yeah, they're more susceptible to any of the other species that I work with. I mean, I don't think I've ever had a baby ball python prolapse, and I've produced thousands and thousands of them. Um, I don't think I've had a baby anything prolapse other than a baby green tree. So they're definitely more susceptible. Um, the etiology of that is, is unknown. There are some theories, uh, to why it happens. Um, probably, you know, once you rule out, um, humidity and hydration, then you can probably start thinking along lines like, you know, we're feeding these things day old mice pinks, That's like which gel. are, <laughs> which are right. Nothing but yeah. a bag of water, essentially. And so they're not getting a lot of coarse uh, stuff going through their GI tract, right? So, uh, you know, that's one of the theories that why they may prolapse. And if you look at all these babies, they all have, when they, when they take a dump after they eat, they all have ink dot, you know. I mean, there is no solid stool at all. It is all liquid uh, for the first many months of their life until they start eating something that's got some real sustenance to it, you know, like a, a fuzzy mouse that's got some bone structure and, and mm -hmm. fur. Yeah. So, yeah. And what's interesting is like, I, I just like kind of understanding a little bit about human anatomy and physiology. I, I, I would think that something made of water mostly would, would kind of actually be the opposite, right? It would hydrate the intestines and the digestive system and it would mm -hmm. cause less complications, but, but, I'm assuming out in the wild that these neos are definitely eating something that, that, you know, are, are, are a lot more, you know, at least calcium dense. Yeah. Calcium or just structure dense. I mean, I right. think the prevailing theory is that these things are eating baby geckos, you know, tiny geckos, maybe even tiny frogs uh, out in the wild. And they just have more, more structure and sustenance to them than a, than a day or two day old mouse pink. Has anyone tried, I'm, I mean, I'm sure they have, but a Knowles to start them out? Yeah, absolutely. And and you can do that. And it's kind of like, it's it's like crack, you know, feeding, feeding a baby. Green tree. <laughs> yeah. Trying to get them uh, off is like the hard an part. Anole. Getting them off. And not only that, but a Knowles and in one of the reasons we don't feed them a Knowles is that can cause a parasite load in the green tree. And that's what happens in the wild. Is, you know, is that all, because most anoles are going to be wild caught that you're you're purchasing, or uh, even or if you find them, you know, out in the yard, yeah, you know, or you find them right. in Indo, or they're eating them in in, in Indonesia, yeah, they're, they're going to cause a parasite load in the animal, and all all animals are, you know, I don't know, I say all, probably the vast majority of green trees in the wild have a parasite load, and they survive. They're skinny. They're half the size of the captive bred stuff. Um, oh yeah, but you don't want it in your, you know, you don't want that in, in your captive bred animals. So that's why we don't okay. typically feed them, um, uh, you know, an olds. Yeah. Um, speaking of, speaking of crack, um, I know that, that, you know, I've had some difficult feeders over the last couple of years with, with 
or actually just mainly this year with uh I, I produced my probably one and only just solo mainland clutch of of retics and that was to try to prove uh my ocelot visual ocelot het endo caramel um mm-hmm. didn't work out by the way um but i had a couple difficult feeders and i got them established off of day old chicks um and uh you know wanted to make sure that i had them going and you know after three feedings of day old chicks they were they were biting and wrapping the rats and the, the mice and dropping them and man it was a pain to finally get them to take that first that first uh mouse or that first rat yeah but they survived right i mean yeah no you, yeah if <laughs> that's you, the biggest if you, difference the, the alternative was is that they weren't we're not going to eat right and right exactly yeah, we do something similar, you know, you, you're familiar with, uh, we use chick down yeah. to scent, uh, you know, our the baby pinks, you know, to for, feed green trees. For our non-country listeners, can you explain what chick downs is? Chick down is just simply you get a, a chick, a baby chick, and you pull the fur off of it. Um, and then you scent the rodent with, with that. It's kind of ironic. It, it definitely makes – they will definitely eat that. It's def, they're definitely – it's alluring to them, but it is not what they would see in the wild. Like right. they're not eating baby birds in the in the wild. They don't even eat birds in the wild as adults, really. It's very rare for them, for them to eat. They eat rodents in the wild. So oh. nobody really knows why they – why the chick down or the scent of a baby chicken would be alluring to these baby green trees that are used to because that's because rats and mice smell like shit (laughs) yeah but you could (laughs) but you but you could take a baby mouse and walk you know wash the scent off of it and it's still they still don't want to eat it a lot of the times so see and, and this is just my ignorance maybe but i always thought that green tree pythons in the wild were eating mostly right. birds and yeah i was i was gonna comment on that because you kind of like were about to like you're like uh, you made a, a surprise comment and it wasn't until like i read an actual research paper like two years ago i think that that uh i don't know when it was published but and correct me if i'm wrong bill or, or if you know any more information add to this but you know green tree pythons are often you know perched up in trees but they actually quite frequently go to the floor to get their food yeah, they uh, these are not canop- canopy dwellers. Yeah, you know these are. And if you and you're right, you're probably talking about a study that was done by Daniel Natouche that dissected, you know, uh, green tree pythons that he found, uh, you know, dead and you know in Indonesia and Australia, and their stomach contents always contain rodents, never never birds. Um, and if you look at these animals hunting in the wild, and a lot of people have documented it, they're, you know, they're ambush hunter hunting rodents. They're, you know, they're dangling down, hunting inches above the ground. They call that roosting. Uh, is that is that uh, the term like roosting, where they're perched and their heads are hanging down and they're hunting? Yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what it's called, uh, but they're obviously in a hunting position and they're just. They're staying there and they wait and they'll stay in that same position all night, you know, just waiting for something to come by. And it's not a bird. You know, they're looking yeah. for rodents. Yeah. Some of my favorite videos online that I see of keepers that, you know, at night will go in their collection, and take videos is the caudal luring that they. Yeah, that that's do. Cool. And they'll do it for hours and hours at a time. Yeah. And what's funny is ba- babies will do it. I mean, just fresh hatched babies, like looking for their first or second meal, they'll do it. It's pretty it- cool. I feel like that's like when it's probably most effective for them because as babies, aren't their tails typically more drastic than the rest of their body? It, it's all, they're always different as babies. Okay. Their tails are always a, a different color than their body. Yeah. That's really, but yeah, Nathan, like when I was like learning about these, like forever ago, um, you know, I I'd heard things like, yeah, green tree pythons and emerald tree bellows have these super long teeth because yeah, you know, yeah, they, that, they, they, they need them to catch birds. <laughs> yeah. and, yeah, right. Right. Well, so and, and how backwards is that? Is it that we always think of green tree pythons catching birds and, and you know, perched up in the trees to catch the birds. And, you know, in captivity, we're mainly feeding them a rodent diet. And then reticulated pythons, we're feeding them a mainly rodent diet, but they're 
I mean, the super dwarf localities we now know are perched up in caves and catching bats. Like, right? Never would have <laughs> would have never guessed that that was what they were. And their teeth are consuming. not near as long as no. a green tree python in you know the same size comparison. No, not at all. Um, so so let me kind of recap. So for neos and younger green tree pythons, you know, you you said up to an eighty eight degree hot spot. Um, and, uh, are adults the, the same way? Or is there a sensitivity between a Neo and an adult at, like that you would keep at different temperatures or what does that look like? Yeah, I'll typically keep, um, adults at a lower temperature. Um, okay. and there's no magic formula or, you know, magic time period, but just eventually after they get out of that 15 quart tub and they get into their adult enclosure, they start getting maybe warm temperatures during the day of 84, 85. Um, and then I'll start introducing a night cycle, which means um, essentially all of my green trees at night, all the supplemental heat goes off. So they just at night, they get ambient. Cool. Adult just get ambient. And usually for me, that's about 75 to 78 degrees at night with no hot spot. And okay. in the morning, the hot spot will come on, and that'll get up to about 85. What thermostats do you use? Uh, I use exclusively herb stats. Okay, cool. me too. Cool. I, I, you know, and and I've talked to a, a gentleman. His name is Stephen. Um, he's here in Texas. Yeah, Stephen uh, Saltzman. Exactly. Um, yeah. And he he historically he's kept them in ambient temperatures, and he he even to this day has talked to me about like he wishes like once they're done with like their setup in their new house that they're doing, he's gonna have a room for the green tree pythons and do it ambient because I, I was picking his brain about keeping them because I keep my retics in ambient. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was telling me the sweet spot was eighty two, you know, and letting it creep up a little bit more, but you know, having the same nighttime drops, and that's exactly what I do with my retics. My retics, you yeah, know, it'll absolutely. it'll creep, it'll creep up to eighty four, maybe touch eighty five ambient for a little bit, and then yep. at nighttime. I let it drop to about 79 to 80. And, and yep. he was actually, he was telling me, he's like, you know, your retakes are going to be fine, but he's like, you know, you could even drop it down to like 76. Yeah, yeah ab- absolutely. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I know um, it is not uncommon for people to keep green trees successfully using ambient. Uh, Ryan Young, who has probably produced more species than, Right. anybody that it, i know of yeah he's keeps green trees he's a legend and he keeps green trees and he keeps them uh ambient the only thing that i would say about ambient temps is i think that now ryan young has produced green trees um so it can certainly be done in ambient temps but i think it i think it's a little harder you know without a temperature gradient fair enough uh you know to to reproduce them it's, yeah you know not that it can't be done. Obviously, Ryan has done it, um, but you know, I think it, yeah. it puts you a little bit behind the eight ball to try to do it. Yeah, one thing that I've noticed with just ambient and switching over to ambient in my garage is is like it takes away so much stress of like the the thermostat and the the beeping that goes off, and you're like, shit, which cage is it? And you're freaking yeah, out. Yeah, which you're like What's which probe, on? which probe is right disconnected right. or gone bad or yeah, right, yeah, um, that, but that panic. Yeah, it, it I, like I, I have not heard that beeping sound in like you know since I switched over, but it, it like for six months after I switched to ambient, I had like phantom. Beeping. <laughs> beeping like I, I, I would i would i would be in my garage and feel like i was hearing the beeping it was like what the hell's going on um i've been but, watching other youtube content and had herp stats beeping in their content and run to my snake room right exactly so that that's been a blessing but what i will say is there's there's what it's taught me of doing ambient is that you have to be okay with like not having precision you have to be okay with a one, one and a half at most a two degree at time fluctuation because of how you're heating your room and how ambient heating works. Um, and so I could see how with green tree pythons that are very specific with, with parameters and husbandry that, you know, keeping an ambient, um, you know, like with a mini split, right. A mini split is going to, you know, increase and decrease temperatures, 
you know, throughout the day. And that that's going to create a little bit of swings. And I could see how that would throw off, you know, a potential breeding or cycling. Yeah, I don't, um, they're not as fragile as you are, are making them out to be in that regard. Oh, good. Good. And I say that because, you know, trends are more important than absolute numbers. So just as long as you can trend cooler, you know, right. that, that, right. then, then that's what you're like when I'm looking to cycle, you know, for, for pairing, you know, I'm looking to trend cooler. Um, so, uh, and again, you know, my room is not climate controlled to the one or two degrees. Mine, you know, my air conditioning and heat switches on and off, you know, just like that. And I'll get multiple degrees during the day. You know, it's not like my incubator where I want it to be within 0.3 degrees, you know, no fluctuation, but my room isn't like that. It's just more about just a a trend, a little colder at night, a little warmer during the day. Okay. And and what do you shoot for at nighttime when you're trying to cycle? Yeah. So I will, uh, I'll drop temps down into the 70 degree, 70, 72. So oh, that's a, that's about a, you know, at the most a five degree drop because at night my ambient temps during non-breeding is 75. So I'll drop down to 72, that's um, awesome. 70 degrees. But again, you know, no supplemental heat at night ever. The right. only time that I am manipulating um, uh, temperatures is just, is is the night so my my ambient temperature during the day year round stays about 75 um and then it you know, when i'm cycling you know that temperature at night will go down to 70 about 70 degrees that's that's awesome i do a lot of my cleaning at night and so i could just imagine just being able <laughs> to drop the t- like and, and instead of cleaning at 84 degrees cleaning at 70 that would be amazing but, but you don't want to clean. You don't. You don't want to clean green tree um, enclosures at night. No. Yeah. No. Definitely not. That. I'm talking about. I'm, I'm. I'm talking about the work that actually makes you sweat, which is the retail. Oh, I'll get you. Yeah. 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 I get you. <laughs> yeah. My favorite time to clean is in the mornings for a, a really good reason with the retics. They're just. Yeah. I don't know if they're just used to being fed at night, but they're always just a little bit more keyed heat up when when it's now nathan do you nathan do you keep your room ambient or you do you no i'm I'm on uh strictly belly heat besides uh my focus cubed which is uh heat panel heat panel yeah Mm -hmm. yeah um i've i've told myself that i would never go back to a gradient but i'll tell you what um I start having issues with breeding green tree pythons in ambient and you better believe I'll, every, well, every one, every one of my enclosures for my retakes has, has a, a heating element to, to, if I needed to go, to go back to it. But, um, I, well, I you, you and I and Ryan Young will get on a conference call when you're ready to breed green trees Yeah, and we'll, and we'll get your ambient temps yeah. figured out. Get me, get me, you know, from the time I get my, 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 you know, a ruse, I think the female is going to be about three. So give me like Couple you know, a year and a half, two years and, yeah. and we'll, we'll talk. Um, so what, one thing about breeding green tree pythons, um, even today. So don't, don't try to gaslight me into saying, Oh, that's old news. Right. They're, they're So I, I want to like, I, there are still people that still struggle to either incubate eggs get their animals to cycle. And I think that's one beautiful thing that I've observed about the green tree Python market in the retake market right now. It, it's almost like a curse. Retics are so easy to breed. And, and, and what sucks about that is they produce so many eggs, yeah. right? But, but then you have a, a snake like a green tree Python where people still struggle to get them to, to breed and I don't know if struggle is the right word, but, but they, they aren't as proficient as retics. Uh, and then, and then on top of that, getting them to get established, right? Like you don't see a lot of like the, the market crashing that is associated with like retics and other industries, but like, how was it when you first started breeding green tree pythons versus where like this season you went six for six, which is insane. Like I, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. You bring up a lot of great points um, because I do think in the grand scheme of things, and, and I only have green trees 
to compare to the other stuff that I breed, right? So I compare it to carpet pythons, ball pythons, Borneo short tails. Um, and they are, you know, if you just across the board, they're more difficult. Um, they can be more difficult really in every kind of aspect of, of the chain. You know, it, it takes a lot of events to hatch a baby or even beyond hatching to establish an animal. You know, you, you have to have the locks, you have to have the ovulation, you know, you have to have laying viable eggs, you have to have successful incubation, you have to have hatching, and then you have to establish a baby. And like, if I compare green trees to ball pythons, every one of those steps is a little bit, it's a little bit more difficult than a ball python. But if you put those a little bit more in six or eight steps, well, then that turns out to be, wow, it's a lot. It's a lot less likely to get, you know, 20 green trees to crawl out of 20 eggs, you know, right. at the end of the breeding season. So it's definitely a little, a little bit more difficult. That's all there is. That's the only way to describe it. But the so good the snakes news themselves is, are difficult. The, the eggs are difficult. The breeding is difficult. But where, where I the, see the, most people messing up is is I, I see a lot of failure in incubation. Incubation is a big one. They it's one of those ones that you they you just really the the eggs are very small and they don't have a large margin of error in their temperature their temperatures and their temperature fluctuation, I think. Yeah. So yes. And in fact, I tell people all the time, if you do not have a reliable incubator that has been tested time and time again, let your mom incubate the eggs in a green tree. You know, I would you'll do, love to do that. You'll, you'll, you'll be more successful. I think than if you try to put it in some, you know, uh, cool, you know, some, you know, uh, igloo cooler thing that you tried to convert and had some heat tape running in it and a fan. Uh, and, I'm, I'm done you know. with that. Yeah, I mean, no, me, me, me and Nathan have both have issues with the igloo method. With, with uh, I mean, yeah, this season was my my final nail in the coffin. All right. <laughs> yeah, no, my, la last last year, man, I I I started in an igloo, which the year before. Uh, the clutch wasn't a great clutch anyways, but it was a wild caught pair of cows. But the, the igloo, it, it just, you know, like two times a week, my wife would wake me up and, and I'd, I'd hear that stupid freaking beep coming from my thermostat. And I'd go down with the <laughs> igloo and, and, I, and I'd have to do that. And then so so on my second year using the igloo, same thing was happening. Spur of a moment, I literally went, bought a, a an old school like, you know, uh, refrigerator, freezer type of thing. Yeah. converted it into an incubator and literally didn't even give a shit at this point. I literally put the eggs in there like when it was running for two days. And and that was, it was amazing. Like temperatures barely fluctuated. So yeah. I'm, See, I'm, we're, I, we're I didn't have any of that. My first year, my, my igloo ran great, incubated all 19 eggs perfectly. And like, I was like, okay, yeah. Second year, no problem. And then go into it. And that's all I had was the constant beeping and drove me nuts running around and trying to dick around with the igloo to get it to the perfect <laughs> temperature all the time. And yeah, this was, it was just such a nightmare. And, you know, I, I ended up having, uh, you know, I think two or three babies that didn't make it out of the egg. One yeah. that was pretty kinked up and I'm sure it was just incubation failure. See, I, I had many years to hone my incubator in and killing ball python clutches, you know, before I before I got involved in green trees. And by the time I got involved in green trees, my incubator, you know, which is dialed in. It was my yeah. boxes were good. My how, how long have you had that fridge for that fridge that, that, <laughs> that fridge? over yeah. 20 over 20 I, years I, I was gonna say i think we talked about this last time yeah. and again you know there's a lot of alcohol involved i don't involve i don't remember <laughs> but but i remember it being a that, long time that you had the same that, incubator do they even make snapple anymore uh, like the drink snapple yeah I, I think so but like you don't see it anywhere <laughs> yeah I, I don't know yeah this is like 
you know, this this could be like what's one of those old colas that they used to make, right? You know, or, or like Sobe or something. Uh, just something <laughs> that's just so like tab, you know. It's like a tab incubator. Oh yeah, right. that, that, you know. That's I mean, it back. <laughs> right. It's so old, but it's I, I, so but dependable. You, you you literally walk into Bill's place and you see the beautiful state of the art Focus Cube enclosure. Shout out to our sponsor. You see these just like mesmerizing green tree pythons. And then you see this like just old ass refrigerator. <laughs> and you're like, why is this dude with these amazing animals? Like doesn't have this, this, you know, this state of the art incubator. But, but what, I mean, at the end of the day, I still have my incubator that I built that year that was solid upstairs and, and I now keep it up there in case I ever need it. Because yeah. I, I, I bought a commercially made one that's kind of similar to a sea serpent's. Yeah, um, yeah. But even what I'm learning with the ambient temperatures, um, PVC is not a good insulator. So I, I have a fluctuation of about, you know, 0.3 degrees, you know, depending on the ambient temperature of my room. And I'm almost to sell it and just bring that, that fridge downstairs. <laughs> 0.3 degrees wouldn't bother me. I get 0.3 degrees fluctuation in, in my incubator too but it's i think people get are in more trouble when they get more than a, a degree fluctuation um, okay fair. in their temperatures yep. and i think i think ball python eggs can tolerate a degree or even two degree fluctuations in a 24-hour period you know that that's kind of doing yeah. this but the green tree eggs they I, they just don't tolerate it yeah i, I think retake eggs can too as long as that that two degree doesn't take you to the 90 degree okay. mark right like yeah for um, sure you know uh, and that's why i, I don't know I, because i never even reached that but i had the degree you know that was probably my peak but, but fluctu- your, fluctuation but your your female also laid on like day eight um, day 50 or yeah, like 55 she, she she laid late that's for it, sure. it was yeah there were there was things from the the get-go that I, I mean i would be interested to see how that would would go but um but another yeah. point on that igloo incubator, and another reason I don't <laughs> advise you, you it for op- people. Up a can I'm of worms, sorry Bill. I brought it up. I'm sorry yeah, I brought you, it up. You opened up a can <laughs> of worms, dude. <laughs> but no, it, it's a condensation thing. Like, yeah, it, it it creates great humidity and reliable humidity. But every time you open to check on your eggs to air out the boxes, and you got to like burp that, the boxes all the time. Yeah, oh, right. that. But uh, you're you're constantly losing water every time you open that lid. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, let let me ask you this, Bill, because one thing that I've talked to MJ extensively on is is the incubation process, and uh, and I've heard this from other people as well. But like, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, or from what I've heard, if it's incorrect or your experience, but like even just a droplet of water from the top of that lid falling onto an egg is not a good thing. I would probably agree with that. Yeah. Which which is totally different of retake eggs because you got people like Jay Brewer who have videos back in like 2015 of him literally hosing down an egg box and wetting no the retake eggs and it being completely. Really? Yeah. And, and it, it, I have it, not seen that video. Yeah, dude, he, he and I, I would talk to Garrett. Garrett would work there, and he's like, "Yeah, he would literally like hose them off." And and mm. um, yeah, I mean, but but you know, green tree python eggs, like, and that was one thing I was telling MJ. Like, he he was talking about the whole water droplets, and and uh, I mentioned I was like, you know what? And, and regardless of anybody's opinion on this individual, but but Kevin over at Nerd, um he was doing a video where he was uh, demonstrating and he was talking highly about the Will Banks incubator. And part of that incubator, he, he pulled out a clutch of, of green tree Python eggs that he had in there and he puts it on a substrate medium. But what he does is he puts, you know, damp, but ringed out moss and Mm -hmm. he covers the entire eggs with them. So Mm -hmm. no water is actually can collect and hit the egg. Gotcha. Um, What, what do you do to prevent like, uh, I mean, in my incubator right now, if I were to set up my perlite the way that I do for my retics and I put my green tree python eggs in there, I'm going to get condensation on the top at least by the second month, by day 60. Okay. Well, yeah, and I certainly see that too. And I love to see moisture in my incubation box. 
You know, I love to see it on the sides, yeah. even a little bit on the top, you know, I mean, but um, I'm very vigilant about towards the end, the last couple of weeks where the water really starts to accumulate on the top of those incubation boxes. I'm opening them every day. I'm opening them oh, every day wow. and I'm wiping the lid, you know, okay, every day. That's good to know. Um, but the first month of the incubation, I never opened the lid. Okay. You know, there's just not, there's just not the condensation that's forming on the top. So yeah. it's kind of a, you know, a, a little bit is, is great, but a lot, you know, could be detrimental. Yeah. Now I've never, I've never that I'm aware of let a bunch of moisture drip on the eggs. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure about if it would be really detrimental, but I tell you, when I see a lot of water on the lid, I wipe it. Oh yeah. Okay. Even with my retake eggs, I did the same thing. And I if I had like the random drop of water, like I was like grabbing a paper towel, wiping yeah, and it off. To like, wipe yeah. It off. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I did that my first, my first season, but, um, I, I, this last year, um, you know, I, I, I kind of, whether it was a correct mentality or not, because, you know, I was thinking, I was like, you know, with retake eggs and, you know, I feel like in the wild, it's definitely raining and these eggs get wet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I observed that, you know, if I, you know, even with my egg box, I would open up the, the box and right. Just, you know, opening up the latch, right. Um, would, would create water to drop down on the eggs. And, uh, I, I never, you know, wipe them off or anything. And they, they, they did fine. Um, but you know, I, I just, I've heard with green tree pythons, like, you know, moisture and water dropping onto that eggs can, can be the difference of that egg surviving or not. It's funny to kind of extrapolate like what you might imagine is happening in the wild. You know, right. like I, I imagine like Maybe. in green trees, you know, that the mother's found, a like a, a hole in a tree trunk somewhere and she's in there you know, and when it's raining, she's, if you've ever seen a, a green tree coil or eggs, you don't see the eggs at all. Like, no, she, they're, they're, I've seen, your, I've seen your egg pulling videos. Yeah. You don't see, yeah, I mean, you don't you see start, eggs at all. Yeah. Until you, until start you start pulling start her off. The so if they're getting wet, they're not getting wet from above. Now yeah. they may, you know, get wet from underneath. Um, yeah. but so it's, it's, you know, it's kind of fun to see like what you think might be happening in nature there. That, that's a good point. Um, and to be honest, you know, the way that I've seen some people do maternal incubation, you know, I, I've always in the back, like, I've always thought that like green tree python um, dams are, are probably some of the best, like mother to those eggs. Like they, they, they wrap them as tight as I've ever seen. It literally looks like a, a bee, you know, yeah. a, 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 I don't know. What am I? Yeah. Beehive. Yeah. Beehive. Yeah, beehive. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'm from Utah. It's the Beehive State, so right, I, I there can't. You go. Let that oh wow! Go. I learn something new every day. Um, so so breeding, you do you do pretty drastic nighttime drops. Um, incubation. What do you like to incubate at? What temperature? I, w I wouldn't call my nighttime drops too too drastic. From like seventy five to seventy. Oh, okay. So you're, you're absolutely right. I so, guess from like a retake perspective, like to keep a retake just at 70, most people would be like, Whoa, really? That's I wouldn't, extreme. I wouldn't That's be extreme. too worried. I mean, I wouldn't be worried, but to like, who no. do you know that, that drops or retakes down to 70 degrees with no, hot no, spot? no, no one. No I mean, one. Even right now, <laughs> I, I don't do that. As long as, you know, during the day you get the, the temps back up and they have that daytime, warm spot right. of 84 85 um right. but yeah uh, but, it gets, it, but anyway it, it gets pretty cold where they're at i mean it drops into the 60s yeah. and mid 60s it, and things like that yeah absolutely even lower even lower i think yeah absolutely in the 60s and you know depending what part of indonesia they're in but i'm uh, sorry so i missed the second part of your your question you, you said yeah uh, what do you what do you incubate at uh so i shoot for 87 to 88 i mean i think that you know, the typical, uh, oh, 87.5. Well, I don't know if it's 87.5. My, I don't have a, you know, a, a Hewlett Packard scientific, you know, mercury <laughs> graded thermos, uh, thermometer in my incubator, but probably somewhere between 87 and 88 degrees. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, and that's actually I I I am I'm, I'm the guy who shoots for 87.5, but typically it ranges from from 80 Seven point five to eighty seven point eight. I actually just looked that's, at it right now, and it's eighty seven point eight. Yeah, that's that's where my temps would be as well. Okay, cool. That that's good to know. So again, not very different from from, and you know that makes sense because they're they're from you know a lot of areas of Indonesia. Yeah, and, you know, yeah Sarah, very Indonesia. similar, very similar climates, right? Yeah. Um. So, if if it's okay with you, uh, I, I want to talk about just like. Uh, designer green tree pythons and breeding and you know w- with retics the the only random or semi-random type of thing that happens is you know things like like calico or um a- am i missing one nathan there there's calico and is there i'm trying to think if there's anything else that that you know i can think of but but essentially what i'm getting at here is with with retics you know you you, you breed a a normal to a tiger you get tigers and you get normals mm-hmm. yeah, um yeah. you 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 know you can definitely selectively breed for certain polygenic traits and and see, play the experiment game but but it seems like with the green tree pythons it is all like an experiment <laughs> yeah it's the, it, there's no it's morphs, all there's an experiment yeah. to the point where you find the animals that produce the animals you want from what i've seen from bill yeah i mean yeah we're, absolutely we're far enough now right but like what what the hell even is the green tree python like like visual aesthetic like how how why is this a thing <laughs> yeah i mean you're exactly right so the green trees don't have the mendelian you know recessive incomplete dominant dominant traits the only the only trait like that um, in green trees is albino. So albino has been the only reset. It's a recessive trait in green trees. And we don't have any more here in the U S I think they're in Germany right now. I'm not even sure if there's a living albino anywhere in, in, in the world. Um, but they, but there have been some, if there aren't, uh, and there've been some in, in the States. Mm-hmm. But they Some seem to be German keeper has his albino <laughs> out there. We know it. It's got to be. He's probably got hundreds of them. <laughs> but I think uh, most people will tell you that the albino green tree is a very delicate creature. Right. Um, like you would expect a lot of albinos, um, you know, in species are, are delicate, fragile. Mm-hmm. But you're absolutely right. The rest of the stuff is either locality. Okay. And you can get pretty consistent results when you pair locality animals you know when you pair an aru to a aru you you get probably you know what you're going to expect in a phenotypical looking animal same with bx you know same with highlands right like like uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, blue dorsals and yeah you bet and you can selectively breed for that like um gary shavino and david brahms are working with manicori types and they're trying to get you know very very blue very distinct even some melanistic in there um some people are trying to work with a ruse for high white so you're saying even within the locality stuff we're pulling out and selectively breeding for higher melanism yeah. oh yeah or just or just cool. better looking you know just like carpet right. pythons you know you want the jungle carpet pythons of today were not what the jungle carpet pythons were 20 years ago you know the as far as the amount of high yellow and high black and locality green trees are are the same way you can really you can selectively breed for traits in those localities Um, but what i focused in has been the designer and designer is just nothing but a flattering way to say mutts you know they're mixed lineages of multiple localities that have been selectively bred for sometimes generations, um, you know, to produce a non-green or a crazy um, color pattern. Yeah, like a typical pixelated. Do you think we'll reach that point in reticulated pythons with all this super dwarf stuff going on? In terms of what? We'll just end up calling them designer. Design super door. <laughs> no, that, that would be that would that would be a slap in the face of the green tree pythons. <laughs> just had to throw it out there. Oh man, um, yeah. It just I like I 
I haven't dug into it really, you know, for, for what, you know, my curious mind would typically do, but I just, I find it so fascinating that there is, there, there is some degree of predictability, but really there's not. Yeah, absolutely. Which, which makes I, it kind of exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. And I'll give you a great example of that. I have a pair of green trees. Um, the male's called Jaeger and the female is My called Bis- Biscuit. Your boy, yeah, Jaeger, is the yeah. sire to yours. I've seen that Ye- pairing. Jaeger has produced many, many unbelievable, beautiful green tree pythons, including the sickness. Well, a guy contacted me about two months ago, and he sent me a picture of a Jaeger biscuit animal, and it looked the spitting image of the sickness. I mean, this thing was oh, no way. black. And so I I'm went back to those. <laughs> I went back and I looked and I talked to him and it turned out that he got the very last pick of the animals for that year. They were released. I, I, bet, I, bet, I bet Alex Warren was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Alex is more than his fair share of raped me from uh from de- from awesome looking designer green I trees just, so. I, just, I just know like i just pulled it up i'll try to get it in the camera but i, I was looking at uh, uh you know bills 2105 jaeger biscuit and don't get me wrong alex love you this is a beautiful animal but but it's a it's 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 a it's a green it's tree python yeah for sure <laughs> right but he absolutely. also has another he has another one from that same pairing that is insane yeah, absolutely. And that's like kind of what the point that you brought up. It is that's kind of the beauty of these things, you know, especially getting them unchanged. You know, I told that guy that I told you, I go, man, you you hit a, gr- a grand slam on this thing, you know. Right. And uh, that's that's the way it is. And that's that's some of the fun fun of it, because, you know, you pair two ruse together and you're going to get, you know, you know what you're you know what you're getting you right. you pair two designer green trees together and you have no idea and, and what i love about it and you can correct me if i'm wrong but you know for example let let's just say um let, let's just say that uh the animal i got from you that's a a jaeger lineage that that produced the sickness this incredibly hypervalinistic animal Let's say the animal just ends up all green. The yeah. fact that it still has that lineage, it has that genetic potential to still produce Absolutely. amazing animals down the road, which is which is really cool. I think what I'm gonna do is everyone has like their their like letters that they put in front of the clutch number in the year. I'm gonna put FG for mine for Forrest Gump because life is like a box of chocolate and you <laughs> never know what you're gonna get. Right, it's, it, it's it, yep. you never know what's going to happen. Not not in not in these things, um, yeah. not in the designer. And I'm blown away every year. You know when I produce uh, different stuff that I just cannot believe that these babies came. You know from these parents and right. It's just it's it's part of the for me. It's part of just the magic of, of the green trees. Right. It's it's you know with with. Uh, and I don't say this negatively about retics, but you you know what your your odds are, and you know what you're you're ideally going to hit. And sometimes the odds don't work in your favor. But with green tree pythons, it's it's this, you know, they hatch, and and I can imagine the feeling that when you look at a a, a neonate come out of the egg, and the thing looks black. Yeah, like the the excitement that that you experience. You know, the retics are a lot like ball pythons. You know, I know right. every year, every time I, I know what I could get. Um, I know the, sometimes the odds are in your favorite and you know it when they come out of the egg for the most part, right? Like, oh, wow, I just hit, you know, I just hit this. Yeah, know, desert goat, cloud, full, pied, whatever the case Yeah, yeah it, exactly. But green trees, you know, you don't know that. And, um, you know, every designer green tree breeders, you know, their desire is what happened to me, you know, the second year that I ever bred green trees. That was the second year that you produced a sickness. Yeah. You gotta be kidding me. 
Second year. I You're ever bred green trees. Lucky son of a bitch, dude. I know. I know. Just <laughs> I I won't say that it was anything but just pure luck and luck on so many different levels. And because that, was that clutch that that, yeah, that was it, a highly that, imported yeah, animal. The, yeah, the, the the female on that clutch was the greenest green you could ever imagine. <laughs> she was just green. Um, but what, what what what's more like special about it is it was my second clutch. So I, it was a good size clutch. I think I had maybe 14 or 16 babies, but I lost almost half of them because I didn't couldn't get them to eat. You know, I just didn't know if I knew what I knew now, then they would have probably all survived. But it was my second clutch, so I'm learning, right? I'm learning how to establish green trees. Well, it just so happened that the sickness survived. You know, it was one of the ones that made it. And, um, you know, I repeated that pairing again. It was another big clutch. So you're looking at, you know, a lot of animals, but nothing ever turned out yeah. like the sickness in, in, in any of them. Yeah. And, and, and I will say that there have been very close two amazing animals that that have that you know jaeger himself has has sired he's in, oh absolutely um which is insane because you know he's he's out there producing you know very black and blue animals but but the guy is a he's a, he's a green and he's, yellow <laughs> yeah he's, so he's with, with a with a few black with you a few almost black called speckles him in him you know <laughs> i did almost call him a retic but but yeah he's he's a green and yellow green tree python with a little bit of black in him and he's yeah. producing some of the darkest blackest green tree pythons that ever exist. he's also he's also produced extremely high yellow which animals, is awesome you know which is like so speaking of all these color phases in the designer stuff like what is your favorite color phase mine yeah yeah, it's melanism for sure. So okay, I, for sure. you know, yeah, absolutely. I, I love blue. Stuff. Yeah, the black stuff. I love blue. I love high blue animals too. And I think there's some synergy between blue and black oh, and green absolutely. trees. So I think I think high blue animals can produce melanistic animals. And I think melanistic animals can produce high blue animals. Okay, um, yeah. But I'm a big fan of the, the black. I mean, once I produce yeah. a sickness, then... I was like, I'm going to just do whatever it takes to try to produce something else. Game over, like this. son. Yeah. Oh, w- w- without a doubt. Um, and and yeah, I don't. Again, it's just kind of that excitement. So, like, I'm a locality guy through and through. Um, even with the retic stuff, you know, my my garage, not including the hatchlings I'm selling. You know, I have about like you know, twenty six, twenty eight retics, and and I'd say easily 90 percent of those are all locality. You're, but, you're not a locality guy anymore. But but that's that's what I'm saying. Like with Green Tree Python, there's th- like this this like kid in me that is excited to just like it, it's like putting your hand in a bag of candy and pulling it yeah. out and just wondering like what it is that you're what do you what you got? Yeah. Um. And uh, yeah, it's it's different. It's exciting. I don't know another species of snake out there that works this way. Um. You know, I, I guess you could say you know. With, with like basins and emeralds, you know, you, you have the, the like crazy stuff that, that, you know, super white, high white, but it seems like almost, um, yeah, but they're, but they're all green and white. They're, they're, they're all green and white. Right. And then you have some that are like really dark green, but, but at the end of the day, they're, they're, I, I mean, y- you would know more than I, is there any other species of snake out there that, that like the, polygenic traits genetics that that works the way that that the unpredictability that that green tree pythons do not that i'm aware of the the only other you know snakes that i've worked with that had polygenic traits were carpet pythons and that's like primarily striping you know you look for a super crazy you know insane tiger stripe or you know um that kind of stuff but gotcha i i'm not familiar with any other snake or reptile that that has such can have such incredibly broad different color changes and and i think a lot of that is because not a lot of these animals are going through ontogenic color changes that can last from 18 months to five years yeah that's that's true um Real quickly, I, I, I this just popped in my head right now, and and we don't have to go into crazy detail about this. But can you explain to me what the heck is a super red? 
Yeah, this is a very interesting question. And it's something that I kept green trees for a long time before I, I really understood or learned that although like designer green trees are polygenic, this whole red baby versus yellow baby mm -hmm. is more um, Mendelian genetics. Okay. So, so if you have say an Aru, an Aru oh, yeah. is a is a is a yellow baby. If you breed an Aru with an Aru, all the babies are going to be yellow. Yeah. Red is dominant in red and yellow babies. Now we're just talking babies. I'm not talking about localities. I'm not talking about designers. Yeah. I'm just talking about if you have yellow babies and red babies and the localities that produce those. Right. Um, so some, some localities like Aru and Kofiao are yellow. Other localities are mixed. So yeah. Biak can produce red or yellow. Manaquari, right? Babies. Manaquari, same. Absolutely. So if you breed, let's say you breed a Biak, you can have red and yellow babies in the clutch. Mm-hmm. The red babies are either going to be capital R, capital R, or capital R, small Y. Okay. Okay. In the capital R, small Y, they're going to be phenotypically red. But they have the capacity for yellow. They have the capacity to produce yellow. Okay. If you breed two animals, let's say you breed an Aru, that's small Y, small Y, right? Yellow, yellow, recessive. And you breed it to an animal that is capital R, capital R, red dominant, all the babies in the clutch are going to be capital R, small y, all red, phenotypically. So, yeah, red just kind of dominates. Red dominates. Red is a dominating, yes. But okay. you, can, you can have a red to a red and still produce yellows. So, so how do you know you have a, a capital R, capital R? Like, how do you get to that point? Like, what would you well, need to, to do? To, to know for sure, you would have to breed it to an animal that was a yellow baby. And and end up with all reds. And end up with all reds. I'm sure the first time that that happened, that person was like, what the hell just happened? Yeah. it. I think it took the, I mean, I, I can only imagine it took a while to figure that out. Nathan just hopped out. I don't know what happened. He just actually texted me. He's like, what happened? I hope he's okay. He's he's good. He was listening on camera. I'm going to tell him to refresh his um, page, but we'll, we'll see if he hops back on. But okay. So, I, that, that, so, so that's kind of why, like, this is a good example. Like, I had two pairings this year, Jaeger, okay, who, who was a red baby, but he can throw yellow babies, so he's not red dominant. I bred him to a female that was um, a yellow baby. And of course, when they produced, they had roughly half red and half yellow, right? Because Jaeger's going to throw his red half of the time. He's going to throw his yellow half of the time. The female's going to throw yellow all the time. So you're going to get big R, little Y, and you're going to get little Y, little Y. Half the clutch is going to be red. Half the clutch is going to be yellow. I bred the same male to a female. That was a red baby. So now you have the chance of getting super reds. Okay. Because Jaeger can throw his big R. The female can throw her big R. And the red, some of the, half of the red babies are going to be red dominant animals. Which is, right. th those are powerful animals to have. Um, because just, I mean, the way it is, is red, red babies tend to be more valuable than yellow babies only because what traditionally they can turn into as adults. Yeah. Again, just kind of part of the joy of breeding these is the unpredictability of what you have. And, and, you know, you don't find out until you do a pairing that, that proves, yeah. you know, that, that you have the, the double, you know, capital yeah. R and, yeah. um, it's it's uh, like I produced. I, I had a clutch this year where I was shocked to see a yellow baby. You know, yellow. I saw, there were two yellow babies because I thought for sure one of the parents were super red, but okay. they weren't. 
but they weren't. So again, it was like, wow, you know, this is just, you just keep learning and this is just, you know, it's, I mean, by far, like genetically speaking, some of the most captivating, you know, just, just, you know, it's, there's so many questions that, you know, at least I have that maybe some people understand, but, but definitely not me. <laughs> Every part of it's just so, so different and so weird. Who would have thought that baby yellow versus red genetics would, would act that way, you know? Right, right. I, I mean, mean, it makes, it makes no sense why I would do that. No. And I mean, I, I can understand the idea of, you know, you know, red definitely creates, uh, you know, definitely like the more designer appealing stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, from a genetic standpoint of it being, you know, a stronger gene or something that, that definitely will overpower things like, you know, it, it's. A, a lot of people think that red is only um, been shown to be the precursor to high blue and high black because the founding members like Trooper liked red babies. So he yeah. worked with red babies and he selectively bred red babies. Well, what if he was a yellow guy? You know, maybe he, you know, selectively, he and Enrico Walder, you know, selectively did yellow. Well, maybe there, you know, would be a lot higher blue and higher black um, animals. 50, you know, you're looking at 50 years later now. Yeah. Yeah. So who, who, who knows? Yeah. Um, all right. Let's jump in here. Um, Bill, um, you know, at the beginning of the episode, I talked about the technical difficulty. So you coming on on the next day, um, can't thank you enough for being flexible to do that. I, I know that we left off kind of talking about the uh, red and yellow Neos and talking about just kind of uh, the genetics and explanation of what a super red is. Yeah, I think uh, so. We covered that, right? Yeah, I mean, we, yeah we, so we, we covered the super red. Yeah, and I mean, I just... Um, obviously had a great time having you on uh nathan unfortunately you know he was busy cutting hair couldn't finish off the episode and we had such a good flow going but i i at least want to get from you just kind of some wrap-up points when it comes to um like for retic keepers or you know those are our listeners mainly uh some people from the the carpet python community but like a message to kind of send out just about green tree pythons like your your um, authentic, I guess, sales pitch, so to say. Yeah. You know, I guess really it's pretty easy. And I, I think it's a lot of it was dictated by when I got into green trees over a decade ago now. And, um, at the time, my mentor who still is an active keeper in the community, his name's Buddy Bashemi, contacted me and said, Hey, let's do a podcast about green tree pythons and I want you to be the co-host. And I was like, buddy, I've had a green tree for a year. I have one green tree python. I've had it for a year. Why do you want me to be the co-host of a green tree, you know, podcast? And he goes, because I want to, I want to, and, and he'd been keeping them for a decade at that time or longer. And he said, because I want to incorporate somebody that's new because maybe you'll have some questions and you know, that I would never even think to ask people that we bring on the show. And so I agreed to do it. And as you know, if you want to learn about a subject matter, like get on a, start a podcast, right? Be the no host kidding. Of the podcast because you will have, you know, you have the most, the experts, you know, in that particular field of, available. And if you're lucky enough to have them on our wealth of knowledge. Yeah. So, I yeah, I was going to say key, key, exactly why we had someone like you come on to talk about chondros for this first segment and just getting that wealth of knowledge about them from you, right? So it's 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 an awesome experience uh, because me and Nathan still kind of knew like in the retake industry. So it's been great having people on and learning. Absolutely. And I can still remember being a brand new green tree keeper. I mean, it, it, it's been a long time ago, but it doesn't seem like it's been a long time ago. And I was so nervous about getting a green tree, like there's some mythical creature. And, you know, basically what I learned after getting one or two or five or 10 was that they're not, they're not. I mean, they're, 
absolutely incredible, but I think sometimes people put them on either too much of this pedestal of that they're they're too hard to keep. Um, they're going to die on me. They're impossible to breed. Babies are impossible to establish. And what I learned, and I wish I'd learned it 10 years earlier, was that that's not the case. These things are just, you know, they're just very special animals. They can be kept easily. And I think maybe I don't remember, but, you know, my mantra was you get the right green tree from the right person and put it in the right box and it will be the easiest snake you'll ever take care of. Yeah. So I'm excited to kind of get that experience. I mean, I going over to your place for the last, you know, couple of years um, or last year alone, uh, I, I realized just you weren't doing anything crazy or special. <laughs> you, you, you had, you had them in boxes with, Birch it with purchase. Yeah. Just like and, you keep your retakes, right? Right. Yeah. Like I, I walked in kind of mind blown by the simplicity of it. I was Super. like, there, there's no way. Super simple. Right. Super Bill, simple. man, um, we, we, we can't thank you enough again for coming on. Uh, I know we did this just last night, but um, want to thank you for being our first guest of our uh, species spotlight. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you uh, on well, I guess now, yeah, like two nights away. Yeah, close. Yeah, looking forward to it, man. Lucas, uh, I value our friendship. Thank you for doing what you do for the reptile community, the retail re community. And it has been an honor to be your first guest on this on this series. Yeah, thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. Have a good night. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon, man. All right, bud. Take care. All right, guys. There you have it. Uh, can't thank Bill enough for, uh, being flexible with that. Uh, just want to remind you guys, we are going to be, uh, in Arlington this weekend. Uh, our episode for next week is, you know, we'll be doing it at Phil Thompson's, uh, at with Thompson cold blooded looking forward to that, that we're going to air the next week. We are not doing the live like we originally attended to, to our Patreon members, we can't thank you enough for the community that you guys have helped us create on our Patreon and our Discord, and we continue to hope and have it grow. So for anybody interested, there is that link down below at patreon.com forward slash the retick lounge. Uh, guys, we are also new on TikTok. We're trying, you know, me and Nathan both kind of contribute to it, and uh, I've never been big on TikTok. So uh, if you guys have TikTok, go ahead and look up the Retick Lounge. We are now on there, and uh, hopefully the the plan is is being able to get on there and do some lives with with Nathan and I, uh, you know, in in the garage in Nathan's snake room, giving you guys that that uh, content as well. But as always, thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next Friday on an episode of the Retick Lounge. <laughs>